Hi guys, welcome back to Cooper River Boatyard here in Charleston, South Carolina. Ava and I have been here now for four or five weeks lending a hand on this Fountain Peugeot Helia 44. As I've mentioned many a time, this is not our boat. It belongs to Ava's sister Nina and her husband Julian. Ava and I are simply just here lending a hand. As you might be able to tell, there is a keel missing over here on the starboard hull. That keel is resting comfortably here on the table. This week's big project is getting this keel reinstalled. My name is Mess, this is my wife Ava. I've spent the last five years on a somewhat extensive refit of our 1987 Warrior 38 named Athena. That was a DIY fun-packed adventure complete with a very extensive osmosis treatment, building a new rudder using vacuum infusion, rebuilding the entire deck, gutting and subsequently rebuilding most of the interior, painting the top sides and a ton of other projects. The summer of 2021 we started cruising full time. Now we're finally ready to begin our adventure. Our little keel adventure here started about three weeks ago when we drilled a bunch of holes to let out an obscene amount of water. After cutting all of the adhesive, that's the only thing attaching the keel to the boat, we were able to remove the keel and open it up. Inside I found a rather horrible application of expanding foam, with no foam at all in the last one third of the keel and big voids in the rest of the keel. We removed all of the wet foam and MDF from the inside of the keel before letting it dry out. A few weeks later I poured new foam inside of the keel, making sure to fill every little nook and cranny before finally being able to close the keel back up and get it all nice and fared. That brings everybody up to date. The keel is now ready to be reinstalled. If you're wondering why it's looking the way it is, that's because I'm holding off on applying primer and also anti-fouling until it's back in its pocket. That way I can make sure I adhere to the overcoating interval for the primer so I won't have to sand in between the primer and the anti-fouling. The reinstallation of the keel is going to be a somewhat tricky process because it's going to be very time dependent. We're going to be using Sigaflex 292 as our adhesive and here in the heat and high humidity in Charleston, this stuff is going to start curing pretty dang fast. Please note that this is Sigaflex 292, not 291, but we'll get back to why we've chosen this adhesive a little bit later in the video. Because it's going to be a little bit tricky getting the keel adhered back in place, we're going to do the only thing you can do when you need to be good at something, and that is practice, practice, practice. The keel is heavy enough that it takes two people to lift it and far too heavy for us to be able to simply manhandle it. We're going to have to figure out a good way of smushing it in place. Fortunately, the yard has a ton of different sizes of wooden blocks they use for blocking boats. These are going to be absolutely essential for us. To be able to lift the keel in place as quickly as possible, I thought a floor jack might be a good option. It would, at least on paper, be able to lift the keel high enough in one go without having to reposition the jack, saving us valuable time once the adhesive is applied. After much head scratching, we move the heavy keel from the table where I've been working on it for the last few weeks in underneath the boat. In addition to the wooden blocks, we also need to make sure we won't damage the keel or ourselves while lifting it in place. To help with that, I built a quick little cradle around the keel to keep it from falling to either side. We made a little platform to raise the floor jack up so we'd be able to lift the keel up into the pocket in one go. The keel is very easy to handle with the jack and with the jack positioned close to the center of gravity, the keel balances nicely on the jack. As a little bit of a safety precaution, we're gonna be placing small blocks of wood under the keel as we're raising it. We were able to lift the keel up, but didn't get it quite into the right position. And we realized a big issue with our current plan. The floor jack has one giant downside, which means I don't think we'll actually be able to use this for lifting the keel into place. As the floor jack is lifting the keel up, it's also pushing it to the side. That's not the end of the world right now when we're just dry fitting, but as soon as we have adhesive on the top of the keel here, if that scrapes against the side of the hull as the keel is going to go up, 
well, it's gonna scrape off all of our adhesive. Sorry about the uh, background noise. Somebody's having a really fun time with an oscillating multi-tool. But uh, yeah, scraping off the adhesive from the top of the keel when we're lifting it up into place would be bad. This is some of the adhesive I cut off of the keel after we removed it. As you can see, it's pretty thick. But this stuff actually never made contact between the keel and the hull. So there's apparently a bit of a gap up there. And that gap we do need to fill to be able to get an adhesive bond. I think for us to maximize our chances of a successful adhesive bond, we need a lift that goes as straight up as possible with as little wobble as possible. We have a different idea we want to try out today, something more similar to the way we got the keel down in the first place. That approach is going to utilize these two smaller bottle jacks here. The big downside to this approach, I think, is going to be that it's more time consuming, but we'll see. There was also something else I wanted to try, a couple of plywood guides to help us guide the keel up into the pocket without scraping off the adhesive. I used an improvised plumb bob and lined the four guides up and secured them with a couple of screws. With the guides in place, we tested the bottle jack method, but it is just far too slow and it also leads to a lot of fore and aft motion that makes lining the keel up harder. After a quick thinking pause to mull things over, I hot glued a square to the hull to give us an easy to see indication of the fore aft position. Now way before we dropped the keel, I marked the fore and aft position on the hull. And here it looks like we need to come forward about one centimeter. How do you move something heavy and hard to handle in an accurate fashion? Well, the same way the Egyptians did. With the keel placed on top of the two pieces of stainless steel tubing, I grabbed a quick measurement as our starting reference, and then we carefully moved the keel exactly one centimeter forward. This worked out really well. We were finally able to do our first accurate and successful lift of the keel. With the keel in place, I glued little pieces of wood to the center lines of both keels, and then used a laser to measure. It looks like we're in a few millimeters of the two keels being parallel. So far, so good. I think we're making excellent progress. We can now position the keel in all the axes we need to. We can position it correctly fore and aft using those little stainless steel tubes. We can also position it correctly relative to the hull, the angle between the keel and the hull using this somewhat dodgy looking template I made before we removed the keel. And using the laces, we can make sure that the two keels are absolutely parallel. The top priority on the to-do list for today is to figure out the last few things, mainly related to the adhesive we'll be using, Sikaflex 292. We reached out to Fountain Bichot and asked them what adhesive they used to put the keels in place originally, and they promptly got back to us with the spec and the model of adhesive they use. Now, unfortunately, we can't get that here in the US, but they recommended we use 292 instead. I think we'll be ready to attempt to adhere the keel in place tomorrow morning, but it is absolutely crucial that we figure out what the open time or what the working time with 292 is here in Charleston. It's hot and humid here, and that's not gonna do us any favors because 292 is a moisture curing adhesive, meaning it cures because of the moisture in the air. These are the specs for Sigaflex 292, and if you look here, it says open time, 30 minutes, but that is at 23 degrees Celsius or 73 degrees Fahrenheit at 50% relative humidity. Here in the high humidity and heat in Charleston, I am 100% sure we're not gonna get 30 minutes. But how much time will we get? That we need to figure out because it is absolutely crucial that we get the keel up and positioned correctly before the adhesive starts to skin over. I made myself a little test board out of a scrap piece of wood, cracked open a fresh tube of 292 and started a timer. I spaced out the samples about two minutes to give us a few different data points. This was actually way more exciting than you would think. After around 20 minutes, I started touching the samples to see when they started forming a skin. Here is what 20 minutes looked like and here is a hair over 21 minutes we need to have the keel in place within 20 minutes. Based on that test, we made a little smush test, smushing a bead at 20, 21, 22, and 23 
minutes. By the end of the day, we can peel off the little stir sticks here and see how that difference in time affected the adhesive bond and how the adhesive spread out. 20 minutes might sound like a lot of time, but in those 20 minutes, we have to apply the adhesive, get the keel lifted up and positioned into its correct position. I think it's gonna be a little tight. After we've practiced the last couple of days lifting and positioning the keel, I feel like we can do that in maybe five minutes. So that leaves 15 minutes to get the adhesive on there. We made a little sample here and compared that with the old bead we pulled off of the keel and measured the surface area of the keel. Turns out we need about 12 to 15 tubes of this stuff per side. There's 17 tubes here, so this is basically one side. That means we're gonna do a lot of cartridge changes. I shudder at the thought of having to apply all of that adhesive by hand. Fortunately, we do have two of these electric gun thingies. I think that is gonna be a must. To lock the keel in place once it is raised without relying solely on the floor jack, I made a couple of quick wooden wedges. These are gonna be a cheap and easy insurance. We timed our last practice run of the day and ended up with a very respectable four minutes. And that includes all of the necessary adjustments and the placement of the wooden wedges. As my very last deed of the day, I ripped the stir sticks off of our little test. The 23 minute stick had a noticeably weaker bond. Good morning, guys. It is a beautiful morning here in the boatyard. And today is the big day. Today is adhesive day. I feel like we've done everything we can to prepare for today. We have practiced the maneuver a bunch of times. We have tested our adhesive. I feel like we are as prepared as we can be. Before we can actually give this a go, we need to drop the keel and clean the surfaces. And we're also gonna be applying a primer. This is the primer we're gonna be using. This is Sikkis 209D. This is a primer that can be used in between, for instance, gel coat or fiberglass laminate and 292. Once the primer is applied, it just needs 10, 15 minutes to flash off before you can then put the adhesive on there. And uh, I figured it was best to wait until this morning so we don't introduce any kind of dust or contaminants on top of the primer. I use Sika's awesome marine pre-treatment chart to figure out what primer to use. I've used that a bunch of times before. It's an awesome resource. I'll include a link for that down in the description. And with that said, let's get rolling here. After so much practice maneuvering the keel, I felt completely comfortable lowering it on my own before busting out some paper towel and some alcohol to give the surfaces a quick wipe. I made sure to flip over the paper towel to use a fresh section of paper towel for each wipe to not just be smearing contaminants around. It's a slower process, but for something like adhering a keel in place, I feel like details matter. The primer goes on super easy, although it was a little bit cramped reaching up into the pocket. I did my very best to get a good uniform coverage, except for the areas behind the guides, which I couldn't quite get to. It seems like the primer dries almost the second it hits the surface. While the primer was flashing off, we prepared our somewhat impressive collection of 292 tubes. Based on the estimate from yesterday, we need 12 to 15 tubes per side. So we prepared 16 tubes per side just to be on the safe side. And just like that, we were ready to start applying adhesive. I started a timer and we set to work. Based on the last few weeks, I'm not the biggest fan of Ryobi tools. Cutting the keel open managed to kill one of their oscillating multi-tools by simply just melting the thing. But for the application of the adhesive, I was thrilled beyond what I can describe with mere words to have one of their electric caulking guns, no matter the color of the tool. I shudder at the thought of pumping 12 tubes of caulk in eight minutes by hand. With Julian on the outside of the keel and me on the inside of the keel, it took us about eight minutes to apply the adhesive before we were ready to lift the keel up into place. Lifting the keel went 100% according to plan and just as our last few practice lifts, 
complete with needing to do a quick fore and aft adjustment along with the hull to keel angle adjustment. With the keel positioned correctly, the pressure was finally off. We spent 16 minutes and 48 seconds out of our estimated 20 minutes of working time. Then it was just a matter of smoothing out the 292 along the seams, peeling off the blue masking tape and going over the adhesive with a wet and soapy finger to get a nice smooth finish. And just like that, the keel is repaired and reinstalled. Now we are going to have to wait a few days until we can apply primer and anti-fouling. We just got to leave the 292 to cure for a few days before we remove the supports. But uh, why don't we celebrate this tremendous milestone by getting away from the yard for a little bit. You guys scamming. Scheming. The historic quality on the side. Typically, you would raise them and cut it about 70 or 80 inches. They did primarily just yard work, pulling small pieces. Put yourself in the portion of the tour, the beginning is guided, then you're on your own to look at it. Fast forward about five days, the 292 should now be plenty cured that we can go ahead and remove the supports. This is both exciting and a tiny bit terrifying. Let's start by removing the wooden wedges. The uh, jack should still support the weight of the keel. Okay, this is the big moment. Let's see what happens. Whew. Now we can go ahead and remove the rest of the supports and our braces. Ta-da! One keel adhered back in place. I was 99% sure it wasn't going to drop out, but this is one of those instances where you don't know until you know. I don't know if what I've done here is the easiest way of repairing and reattaching the keel. There might be an easier way that somebody can think of, but at the very least, I hope what we've done in these three keel videos will serve as a bit of inspiration for somebody that might have to go through the same adventure. At the very least, the video where we drop the keel should serve as some inspiration. I have still not, as of uploading this video, found uh, any other videos here on YouTube that shows the act of dropping a keel. I found a couple that shows uh, like repairs and adhering them back in place, but the actual removal of the keel I think that was a YouTube first. In next week's video, it's time to tie up the last loose ends here in Charleston before Ava and I leave. We gotta prime and anti-file the keel, get some anti-fouling on the sail drives and also prop speed on the props. So next week's video is still gonna be a tiny bit of DIY, but then it'll be time for Ava and I to leave Charleston and drive up to the boat show in Annapolis. On the way up there, we hope to check out a few boats. I don't think any of those are going to be the replacement for Athena, but they might help steer us towards what we really want in a potential Athena upgrade. Anywho, I hope to see all of you guys back here in the yard next week for a little bit more oh, glorious DIY. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below and don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, please remember to leave a like. See you!